glory to God. Glory to God. Come on in. We're getting ready to do our prayer service tonight. And we got a special prayer service. We will be going over the seventh chapter of my book, Faithfully Favored and Fit. God put it in my heart and my spirit for me to pray over people so that they will have the heart, the mind, the capacity to be able to serve. So come on in the room and go ahead and center yourself and remember that you're in God's most holy presence. Go ahead and yield and surrender all and say, Father God, I ask and pray for forgiveness tonight. That if I have said or done anything that's contrary to your will, I ask and pray, God, that you forgive me, that you cleanse me, and you wash me, and you purge me with your son. And go ahead and receive that forgiveness because his word says he's faithful and he's just. To forgive you of your sins, he said he will blot out your transgression as far as the east is from the west. And he wouldn't even remember them no more. So go ahead and receive your forgiveness. There's power in the act of forgiveness. Just go ahead and ask God for it. That as we center ourselves, we decrease in God that you may increase in us. And Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together, God, that we can break bread, God. That we can encourage, to exhort, to equip, to build up each other. And Father God, that as we go through this lesson, God, Father God, to let them know that they have power. They have the dunamis power, the authoritative power, that they can call those things that be not as though they were. Father God, I pray for a change in the mind, a change in the heart, a change in behaviors, God. Father God, that we may be fit for your kingdom. Father God, we thank you for this chapter, the power, principles, and characteristics of a servant leader. Father God, we realize that you are the greatest one. And the greatest one amongst us, he was a servant. And Father God, I will pray tonight that each and every one that come in the room, that they come in, that they're able to bow down in your presence, that they purpose in their heart that I'm going to serve as unto the Lord. There was a quote that I got from Mother Teresa. And it says, people are often unreasonable, illogical, self-centered, and she said to forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterioritive motives. But she says to be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some false friends and some true friends. He, she says to succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. So the bottom line is that don't allow anyone to move you out of your place of character and integrity. She said what you spend time building, someone could destroy it overnight. She said build anyway. Because hello Gwen, I was praying for y'all and covering y'all and just knowing that God's angels was all around you and protecting you. And I continue to pray and lift up your family during your time of bereavement. And just know that you're in our heart here at my heart to you. Uh, and we're going into our lesson. And what Mother Teresa said, if you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. But the, what she says, to be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. But she says to do good anyway. Give the world your best anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. So we know Mother Teresa, and we know what all of the great attributes that she did. And, and I'm sure that people talked about her, people was jealous, intimidated, but she still went about doing good. So I pray tonight that no matter what the situation, that you continue to do good. See, God's view on leadership. We have a lot of people in the body of Christ want to be a leader. But his leadership is servanthood. And I pray that you receive the concept of that you're going to be a servant of the Most High God. So these power principles, when we talk about power, we're talking about that dunamis power, that authoritative power, that's that azusia power. God has given you the power that you are able to submit that you are able to humble yourself. You're able to walk in character and integrity. So these power principles that I review also transcend into many areas. And a lot of times it's outside of the four walls 
outside of the church. It can be in your business. I pray for business tonight. I pray for corporation. I pray for the community. So when God had given me the concept about servanthood, we got to serve other ways outside of the church we got to get into the place that we're going to volunteer we're going to the prison we're feeding the homeless so we got to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of god and knowing that in due season we're going to reap and we faint not so the way to become a leader is to first become a servant in order for you to find your gift and find your niche and find your calling is that you need to find your place of service I can tell you from experience that whatever my hands find to do, I was a background person and I serve. And every time I serve, I serve with excellence. And I pray that you get into a position you're not looking for affirmation. You're not looking for somebody to pat you on the back. That you're doing it as unto God. Because if you got an alternative motive, then you're not going to last. So how do you know when you have that servant attitude? Your attitude has to be correct. And I will answer this question from my personal standpoint. I know that you have a servant attitude when you react like a servant. That you're not high-minded. You're not boastful. You're not got an ego. You're not prideful. You must know who you are. See, the greatest servant, you can be in a place, I know who I am. I know who I am and where I am. And I know where I'm going. And I know who I am in Christ. So when you are serving as unto the Lord, then you don't have to worry about because it's going to be the naysayers out there going to tell you that you're being a flunky. Why you continue to do this? But you know that you're doing it as unto the Lord. And I pray that you take on that spirit of a servant tonight. He said, let's walk through these power principles and some of the characteristics so that we can align. I pray tonight that you align your behaviors and your attitudes so that you be able to prepare. See, what preparation meets opportunity, then there's manifestation. Too many times we have leaders who want to bypass the process of being a servant. But how can you, you lead if you hadn't learned how to follow? So we want to go and we want to be prepared for our kingdom assignment. God told me, he said, I want you to build champions for Christ. He said, I want you to be able to help them to get fit. You know, I'm a dietitian, but when he was telling me about being fit, he said, it has to be faithful. You got to walk in fearless integrity with your time, your talent, and your treasures. So you got to be able to serve as unto the Lord. So one of the first principles that God had given me is that a servant must have a humble heart. Chuck Swindoll says, there are two primary marks of a humility in a life of a believer. The first is that you have a non-threatened attitude when you're confronted by another person. And you know what I tell people, I said, I said, now you cannot allow someone's behavior to change your behavior. Because when that person is cursing or talking negative, then if you take on that characteristic of that person, you have given up your power. And we don't want to give up our power because we're going to continue to walk in character and integrity. So that's one of the traits of a servant. You can be confronted without getting angry. See, God will give you the peace that surpasses all understanding. So I pray for each servant tonight that you take on the characteristic of a humble heart. And the second mark of a humble heart is you have a deep sensitivity to the need of others. You're compassionate. And then God will place it in your spirit. The more that you do for God, then the more God can use you. The more you humble yourself, the more you make yourself available. I often hear Dr. Robert said that it's for those that show up. A lot of times you wonder why people get put into position or get promoted. A lot of times it's all because they showed up and they kept showing up and they kept on serving as unto the Lord. And the word of God said, what you make happen for another man, God will make that happen for you. So my power question, I have some power question that I have in my book is that what condition is my heart in? Is it a, a, a stone cold heart or am I pliable? Am I pliable? So you got to be pliable. You got to have the heart of compassion, the heart of love, the heart of giving. So your heart has to be pliable. 
So my second characteristic with this power of a servant leader is that a servant leader must have an honest heart. It is very vital. That's one thing I can't stand. It's a liar. And the word of God said, a liar will not even tarry in his eyesight. Just tell me the truth and then we can work through the process. But when you're lying and then I don't know who you are. Because when a person shows you who they are, you need to start believing them. So when we're talking about this power principle of serving, we pray tonight that you get into a posture that you have an honest heart. A heart without guile, with a heart without deception. And a person who is honest in the biblical sense has a heart where what you see is what you get. See, one of the things that I tell people, I don't put on any facade for anyone. What you see is what you get. And one thing that I had to learn over the years, and I would not allow anyone to move me out of that place, is that I love Patricia. And God told me, Patricia, you are enough. And I want to encourage you to get comfortable in your skin and know that God, he, he said, you are fearfully and you are wonderfully made. Not only that, he said, you are enough. So you got to first be honest with yourself. So a person who is honest in the biblical sense, they have a heart with that what you see, whether I'm in the supermarket, whether I'm at a huge conference, whether I'm in the boardroom, what you see in essence is what you get. You don't have to go through all of the mess to figure out which person am I dealing with? Who am I talking to right now? So I'm praying that you get that servant heart that with an honest heart, honest means truth, integrity, that you're doing what's right when no one else is looking that you're going to walk in character and integrity, wholeness. There's no schemes, no plots, no, no trickery, no manipulation. But I want you to serve with an honest heart. There's no deceit. You're not playing no games. You're no tit for tat. In order to serve as unto the Lord, you got to have an honest heart. So that's one of the principles. So let's look at Psalm 15. It will challenge you on the issue of honesty and integrity. I pray tonight that you walk in honesty and integrity. Lord, he said, who may dwell in your sanctuary and who may live on your holy hill? And he answered, he said, he who walk is blameless and who does not and who does what is righteous and who speaks glory to God truth from his heart and has no slander in his tongue. See, we got to walk in character and integrity. So I read a phrase that has stuck with me and blessed me, and I hope that it does the same for you. Christians should practice habitual honesty. Glory to God. So when it's habitual, that means you have a habit. And people know that when I'm talking to you, I know she's telling me the truth. That I can trust her. I can believe what's coming out of her mouth. That she's not just talking to talk, but she's walking the walk. So I pray that you have an honest heart. That is a truth as a standard operating procedure. You know, in the business world, we have what we call the SOP. And you know, it's a standard. It's a standard operating procedure. So with us as a Christian, as a servant, we should, this should be our SOP. That means that this is just the standard. This is who I am. I'm a servant of the Most High God, and I have an honest heart, and I'm going to speak what is true in my heart. Integrity as a way of life. It's not something you put on the front. Because you know what? It doesn't matter where you go if you think you're hiding out somewhere. Let me tell you, when I was doing uh, missions, mission trips to El Salvador, and I was at one of the markets in El Salvador, in a third world country, and I was talking to the delegation, and, and the person that was next door heard me talking, and you know what they said? They said, um, did you say that you go to Southern Miss? I'm like, okay, I'm in El Salvador. And that person went to the same college that I went to. So when you're trying to duck and hide, you can't hide from God. You got to be honest, just be real, just be transparent and allow God to heal you. Wherever that you may be broken, he said, honesty in all that we do. 
honesty in all that we say, honesty in all of our action. This is a great identifier. You can tell a servant because he has an honest heart. And see, we know that we hadn't always been at that place, and we're striving for perfection. And we, we look back over our life, and we see how far God has brought us, and he has never left us. But we're going to strive for that SOP, that standard of operating procedure. And I pray tonight that you will get into a place that you have habitual honesty. And that you know there's no mascara therapy, there's no facade. What you see is what you get. So my power question that you need to ask yourself, these are questions I ask myself. Am I honest? Glory to God. Am I honest about my service to the kingdom? So you've got to be honest with yourself. Are you really trying to serve the Lord? Are you, you have an alternative motive? Are you looking at, I'm going to do a tit for tat. If I do this, I'll climb this ladder. I'll go higher here. But you know what? The greatest amongst us, he was a servant. So our third principle tonight, a servant must have an unselfish heart. We have been given the privilege of being a part of the greatest cause in history, the kingdom of God on earth. See, because he says in Matthew 6 and 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And then he gave us this here bridge, and he said all of these other things are about to be added. But we have to be in a place that we are seeking the kingdom, that we have an unselfish heart, that when we're doing things, we're doing it as unto the Lord. The only thing that matters is that God's kingdom is going forward. It's not about my kingdom. We said thy kingdom come and his will be done. So we have to make sure that everything that we're doing, we're doing it as unto the Lord. It said the only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is that God's kingdom goes forward. You know, we have to put aside all our feelings, all our emotion, or what somebody said about me, did about me. No, it's time for us to advance the kingdom. And in advancing the kingdom, we have to have an unselfish heart. And see, if we, we invest the kingdom and we have prioritized, then we said that Jesus Christ will be praised. We have to get into a place and a posture that is all about him and not about us. It's not about what happened to you and I. If you're elevated to another level, that's good. If you are demoted down to another level, that's okay. The only thing that really, really matters is God's kingdom on earth. The word of God is the only thing that's going to last forever. You can have all of the money, all of the friends, all of the resources, but they are gone, not going to last. It said the word of God is the only thing that's going to last. So we got to make sure that we don't have a selfish heart. So that's the key of an unselfish heart. In Philippians, the first chapter, Paul indicated that he was in jail. And he said, I'm in a strait between the two. Whether to live or whether to die. Whether to stay in jail or whether to be released or whether I'm going to die and go to heaven. Then he says, it doesn't matter. So you got to, when you're serving God and when you're saying that you're going to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him, Paul said, it doesn't matter to me. The only thing that matters is that whether I live or whether I die, Jesus Christ be praised. No matter what we do, and we need to make sure that Jesus is the center of everything that we do. Jesus is the center of our church, our community, our home, our relationship, on our job. Because we need to serve with an unselfish, we can't say it's my degree. It can't be that I'm making six figures and I got the money, I got the intellect, I got all of these. Because you know what, God, when the anointing, he, God will put the anointing on your life. And he said he wasn't going to make your relationship great. He didn't say that I'm going to make your website great. He didn't say I'm going to make your community great. He said, I will make your name great. So it's something about having a great name and you preserve that reputation. 
So if we can honestly say, Lord, it doesn't matter what happens to me. The only thing that matters is that your work goes forward. So when you take on the spirit and the characteristic of being a servant, you're in a place and say, Lord, it's not about me. It's all about how I can progress the kingdom. He said the kingdom suffers violence, but it's the violence that take it by force. So we want to make sure that everything that we do, that Jesus Christ be glorified. When we put Jesus first, it will literally revolutionize our life and the lives of those that serve us. Because we're serving with an unselfish heart. I'm not trying to do it so that I can just move with you. And if I do this, then you're going to do that. Or if I do this here, you're going to take me to another level. No, no, no. I know what the word of God says in Hebrews 11 and 6. He said, he that cometh to God without faith is impossible to please God. And he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that he is the one who is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we want to make sure that everything that we do, I pray tonight that you have an unselfish heart. I pray that you have an honest heart. I pray that you have a humble heart. And now we're going into the power question. What am I holding back? I want you to think about that as we're praying and I want you to meditate on that. What am I holding back and why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I have a tear to motive or have God called me into this arena? Did God give me the grace that I'm able to do this? But then why am I holding back? If God have called me, he would equip me. God will qualify me, but get into the place of why am I doing what I'm doing and why am I holding back if God told me to go forward? He said in his word of Philippians, we have to forget those things that are behind us. And as you're forgetting, you got to reach forward and then you got to press. There's a blessing in the present. There's a mark. Press toward the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. When you're a servant, when you're using these power principles, you realize that you have the power. God has given you the power and the anointing. He said, he said, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of a power, a love, and a sound mind. So our fourth principle that we're going to talk about is that a servant, glory to God, you need to hear this one. Because a lot of people have bypassed this one. A servant must have a given heart. And you, he, he was, our father was the greatest giver. In John 3, 16, he said, for, for God so loved the world that he did something. That he gave. He gave. And see, we have to give out of ourselves. And sometimes it, it, it's not popular. Sometimes it doesn't feel good, and sometimes people will say, why are you doing all of this? You know you're tired, but, but I know who my Redeemer is, and I know that he died on the cross for me, and I know that he loved me so much that he, he gave his only begotten son. See, when you can understand that concept that he's such the greatest giver, then you as a servant, you must have a given heart. He said, but you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he was rich, y'all, yet for your sake, I pray that you get this concept, that yet for your sake, he became poor, so that through his poverty, that you might be made rich. Glory to God. See, he gave something. He gave his only begotten son. So on the night before he was crucified, so that you would understand what he was about to do, Jesus did something. Jesus gave us such a great example of a servant. So we can use this as a pattern. Jesus knelt and he gave them a parable in action. And so in this essence, it's saying that we shouldn't just be talking about serving, but we should be actually putting our hands to the plow and serve as unto the Lord. And this is what Jesus said. It said, taking the towel and the basin, he took those dirty feet. Now, this is Jesus. This is our king of king, our alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, the one who is, the one to come. 
He is he's all of this. He's the bright and morning star. But then Jesus, he gave an example. If Jesus was a servant, he said he taken the towel and the basin. He took those dirty things because you know that in biblical time there were sandals. And so you know if you had sandals, you got all that dirt and that crud on your feet. He said he took those dirty feet and he brushed them off. And one by one, he washed that dirty, that smelly, repulsive feet of those men from Galilee. Okay, we're saying that we are servants. And we're saying that we want to be like Christ. Can we serve as unto God? See, because you know what? I served for years at Stop the Madness in the shoe ministry. And so we, we took on the characteristic of Jesus that we got down and we washed their feet and we prayed for them. And then we gave them a new pair of shoes. But there's everyone, they, they wouldn't make themselves available. And at times there wasn't enough service that would be under them. We had a whole line of people out there, but because there was not enough servants that was willing to get down and wash their feet, that sometimes it delayed the process. But nevertheless, the servants that chose to be under the tent, to humble themselves, to have a given heart, that they not only bless the people, but then they bless themselves by the feeling. It's such a great feeling when you can give out of your heart and out of compassion and you're able to help and to assist somebody else. So he says, as he washed, he began educating him. And see, and that's what you got to educate so they can understand this principle. And he was empowering them. And, and that's one of the characteristics and traits that God had given me to empower, to ignite your passion and activate your faith so that you're able to walk forward and to take, make an impact in the world so that you can lead and walk in fitness with your mind, body, and spirit and to know that, yes, you are enough of the kingdom. See, God gave me an assignment. He said, I want you to build champions. But these champions are going to build, be built up from the concept of being a servant. See, a lot of people will get it twisted and they will think that we need to go another route. But your way down is your way up. You got to humble yourself because the word of God says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You got to humble yourself. You got to be willing to serve as unto the Lord. So as he was educating and as he was empowering them, he said, men, you see what I'm doing? Glory to God. See, let's left an example. Men, do you see what I'm doing? As I have done for you, I want you to go and I want you to do for one another. And we're saying that, that we are full of the Holy Ghost, fire baptized, devil stumping, tongue talking. We are anointed, pointed. We are apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. But we're not a servant. Glory to God. My greatest title, I have a lot of titles. I have a lot of credentials. But my greatest title, that I'm a servant. And God has gifted me in that area to be able to serve. And see, and, and I've been talked about and criticized and marginalized and put down because I'm a servant, because I have a given heart. But don't worry about what the naysayer, what the people say, serve anyway, because God has greatness that's locked up inside of you. And he said, if you want to be a leader, glory to God. You're going to end up frustrated in life because very few people want to be led. But if you aim to be a servant, you would never be disappointed. See, because people want to follow people that have this heart of, of a servant. That they're honest. They're unselfish. They have a given heart. See, because that's what people want to follow servants. Meek and humble, that they're not high-minded, they're not puffed up, they're not walking with egotistical pride and, and walking as a narcissistic behavior and want to manipulate you and intimidate you. No, no, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So our power question is what stipulation and restriction am I putting on my servitude for the kingdom? Should I say it one more time? What stipulation that you have restricted God said, I will serve you in this capacity. 
But when it's saying I got to get up early in the morning, I got to go out in the sun, or I got to go and get on a plane and go to El Salvador to a place I have never been, and I got to work and I got to serve and volunteer and give out of my spirit, my heart, and, and, and get in, in line with the people, work 14 to 16 hours with them, and because they have a spirit of, 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 of hospitality and they're constantly smiling, even though they don't have much, that can you get into that place with them and serve as unto the Lord without being high-minded or thinking I'm too good that I can't do that, that you need to be serving me. No, 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 the greatest one, Jesus, he was a servant. So but what stipulation and restriction are you putting on your servitude for the kingdom? Glory to God. God has given me such a passion and given me such a desire. He said, there's a burning need. Glory to God. He said, I'm looking all over the world and I'm looking in the churches and I'm seeing titles. I'm looking on Facebook. I'm looking on Instagram and I'm looking on uh, all of the YouTube and Periscope and everybody got their own platform. But do we have enough loving people serving? Glory to God. Are you willing to serve it? Are you willing to come off your podium and serve? Are you able to come and get your hands dirty? Glory to God. What Jesus did, he got down and he, he started empowering his disciples. He started educating them and he said, what you see me do, I want you to do it also. So I pray tonight that you're able to take on that spirit that I'm going to be a giver. Because Jesus gave it all. So our next, the fifth principle, a servant is willing to suffer. Glory to your name. He said, because if you suffer with me, he said, you will reign with me. He said, many are the affliction of the righteous, but it's God that will deliver you out of them all. So in Mark 10, 32 through 45, these verses deal with spiritual leadership. In these verses, Jesus describes what true spiritual leadership is. He also demonstrates what true spiritual leadership is, and it boils down to two words. Glory to God. Selfless service. Selfless service. The way to lead people spiritually is not by manipulation or by a special technique or through intimidation. Genuine spiritual leadership takes place when, when you give of yourself sacrificially in service to others. Yes, it's good to have a, a, a succession plan, a, a strategic plan, an operation plan, but the greatest thing is that you have to have selfless service. That is not by manipulation and not by intimidation, but you're able to give sacrificially your service to others. Great leaders lead by becoming a servant of all. Did you hear me? Because the, the way that I have gotten promoted in life, all through my life, it wasn't so much that I was always qualified, but I made myself available. I showed up. And I saw a need without somebody having to tell me, you need to go and do that. You need to identify an area. If God is calling you, there's a burning passion and that you're seeing that it's, it's grieving your spirit. And see, it was grieving my spirit about the, the low numbers of people who serving in the kingdom. So what God told me, he said, I want you to be a servant. And he said, I want you to write this book on faithfully, favor, and fit. Five power principles to excel in while you serve with a pure heart. That you can serve and you can excel. See, a lot of people think that in the service, because even, even in, in the business arena, they look at the service staff as the low people on the totem pole. But you know, I worked for a company and we did a whole training on the servant leadership style, in which you would see a pyramid the, the normal kind of leadership style is that you see the CEO on top 
and then you'll see the vice presidents and then you will see you know like the managers and the unit managers and then at the bottom at the base where you know the most of the people are you will see like housekeeping laundry dial here all the cnas and so we looked at that concept and we said we need to flip the script and so we flipped it in the natural, in the corporate setting. See, what would they have done in the corporate setting? That they have taken the principle from the word of God and applied it to the way that they're going to run their facility. So what we, in essence, we did, we flipped the pyramid. So at the top of the pyramid was the people that was considered the ones that were low on the totem pole. But we got to the point where we did an analysis, we realized that without these people, we couldn't make it. We couldn't have a spirit of excellence. It wouldn't be clean. It wouldn't smell good. We wouldn't have quality food service. The, the resident wouldn't be taken care of. So we flipped the script. And we allowed the CEO, the senior leadership team, we allowed everyone above us to sit on top of us. So we said that we're going to be a servant leader and we're going to serve you. We're going to serve you. And so it's changed the whole philosophy in the company when they realized that it wasn't that us and them mentality or up the hill and down the hill. No, we're all in this together and, and that we have a common goal and we cannot make it without you. So when you get to the place, it says genuine spiritual leadership take place when you give of yourself sacrificially in service to others. Great leaders lead by becoming servant of all. Jesus, glory to God, we go back to Jesus because he is the epitome of servant, the epitome of servanthood. And we see that he served to the point of death. He also suffered the punishment of the wrath of God that our sins deserve. He went on the cross for us. The suffering of Jesus was completely undeserved. John 15, 25 says, they hated him. So when people hate you, you still got to love them. They hated Jesus. They hated Jesus without a cause. Jesus was sinless, and yet he suffered the fate that our sins deserve becoming sin for us. The willingness of Jesus to suffer ought to be true of every leader in the church. Glory. Serving leadership is the willingness to spend and to be spent and to give it all for Christ. So how many of you are in a position still saying, I'm sold out to you, God, where you lead, I'll follow I'm committing my ways to you, God, and I know that you're going to bring them to pass. And the power question that goes with this principle, have I given my all to Christ and turned from my will to the will of the Father? See, because, you know, when I, uh, before I accepted my calling, God had called me in 1993. And, but I had them conceptualized in my head that no, they won't receive me or it's going to be too hard. And, and, and this town and this arena is best that, you know, I still teach Sunday school, I teach Bible study, but don't give me that title. So in essence, I, 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 you know, I didn't turn my will totally and completely over to God's will because I was saying, you know, there's some more things that I want to do. Some places I want to go. And, and when you have that, that stigma of having that title as a minister, then it's a weight to go with it. So I didn't give my all to him. And, you know, it wasn't until eight years later, eight is the number of new beginning, and God dropped me here in Central Nail. He shut down a house that I was building from the ground up. He shut it down. It went into Fort Bankruptcy. Lost all my money and everything that's in it. Because God said, that's not the plan that I have for you. He said, I have a plan and I have a future and a hope. And I'm going to bring you to an expected end. So he had to shut some things down. So, so I don't want you to get weary when some things start shutting down. That could be God saying, no, no, you're on the wrong path. So I'm just directing you. I had to shut this down so you can know that I'm God. And that beside me, there is no other. 
So have you given your all? See, when he said all, he said turning your will over to his will. What are those things, those proclivities that you're still holding on that you haven't totally submitted? Totally. See, see, when you're being a servant, you got to do a self-examination. So the sixth principle is a servant leader of Jesus Christ and his church must have his basin and his towel attitude. That means that you're willing to get down and wash somebody else's feet. That means that you may have to clean the bathroom, uh, vacuum the carpet, uh, or you may have to clean the parking lot, uh, work in the nursery. John 13, 1 and 17, and 1 Corinthians 9, 26, 27, these are some reference. When we are saved into Christ, we are saved into a community of believers. So as we serve one another, we develop relationships. We grow bridges between us and between people who would naturally be our enemies. Christ's love, it is Christ's love, that agape love, that Christ's love that makes it possible to serve and to love one another. So you have to make sure that you have the love of God in your heart. And that's why we started off with that unselfish heart, an honest heart. So you got to make sure that you're doing it for the right reason. You're not trying to do it for an alternative motive. So the call is now to us. So I pray tonight as the call is going forward for servant. He said the call is to us as his followers to grow communities in our churches, grow some community in various settings, whether it is it's out on the ball field at the schoolhouse uh whether it's uh at the baseball field or whether you're walking in the park or the supermarket wherever your region that god has given you wherever you have grace he said a call is now for us as his followers to grow communities by taking on this basin and towels mentality jesus demonstrated servant leadership in a most vivid fashion he washed his disciples' feet. Now, he was the leader, the king of kings and the lord of lords. But he humbled himself and he gave them an experience. So then he said, I do this, and so now I need for you to do it. He demonstrated his love to his disciples in which he loved his disciples. He was possessive. He loved his own. He continued to love them to the end. Can we say that? about the people that we serve with, we walk with, that we're in community with. Jesus' love was unconditional. He even washed Judas' feet. And we know what Judas did. Judas was a betrayer. But Jesus, he still loved. He still washed his feet. He was unselfish. And that's what kind of heart. I pray that you receive that unselfish heart, that honest heart, a heart of character and integrity. And he said, and he continued to serve during the most difficult hours. Can you still serve when you're being challenged? Can you still serve when, when you may not have it all together? Let me tell you, I had to continue to serve that I had gotten down to because when God called me, I said yes. And when I said yes, that means that yes to everything. And I said, to you, God, I live. To you, God, I move. To you, God, I breathe. And I have my very being. That I give it all to you. So, you know, sometimes you may have a test to see what's coming out of your mouth is actually going to be acted upon. So as I was serving him, as I was consistently coming to the church, keeping the doors open, doing my Sunday school, the Bible study, and also teaching and, and cleaning and doing everything and paying the rent. And I got down to 38 cents. But you know what? I still serve as unto God. Because I knew that there was no failure in God. I knew that what I made happen for another man, God was going to make it happen for me. And I know what Luke 6 and 38 says. He said that as you have given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over. And he's going to cause men to give into your bosom. See, because if I had to move out of the will of God and got into flesh, then I would have missed my blessing. See, God, he sent my blessing knocking on the door. 
And when I answered the door, that was my blessing. See, and even in the midst of getting down to 38 cents, my credit score went up. I didn't miss paying not one note. All my bills were on time. See, that's God. See, he will give you that favor. He has graced you to do it. But sometimes you go through that process to see, are you still going to serve me? Are you still going to obey me? Even when you don't have in the natural what you think you should have. But God already knew what I needed before I even asked. See that Isaiah 65 and 24, he said, Tricia, before you even call me, I have answered. And while you're yet speaking, I have heard your prayer. And the prayer came knocking on the door. Not only was it enough that I was able to get my bills up and not even have to worry about the bills for a few months, but then he said, I'm going to give you enough. Didn't know I was going to be in the process of writing a book. So he gave me enough that I was going to have to finance writing my book. Let me tell you how God is. If you can't be God serving, you can't be God giving. So I want you to get into the place and in the posture that I'm going to give and I'm going to serve as unto the Lord. And you know what Dr. Martin Luther King said? I remember I spoke one time and I did the keynote speaker. And, and so I talked about Dr. King and one thing that stayed with me, that everybody can be great because Anybody can serve. Everybody can be great. So if you want to be great, start serving. Let your work speak for you. Don't you try to go out there and make it happen. Just turn out and make a mess. But allow your work to speak for you. That when it goes through the fire, it's going to come out as pure gold. So the power question that we're going to ask, what is it that motivates me to serve? What is it that motivates you to serve? What is my primary motivation? And do I have an alternative motive? See, all of this is in chapter 8 of my book that will be coming out very soon. And it's all about serving. But you got to ask yourself, these are some questions, some transparent questions that you need to ask yourself. It's not for somebody else, but it's for you to ask yourself, what motivates me to serve? And what is my primary motivation? And do I have an ulterior motive? Am I looking to do tit for tat? You do this for me and I do that for you. You got to make sure that you serve God with a pure heart. So my seventh principle is a servant leader must not neglect their family. My God. And this is huge because a lot of times, you know, in the church you get so busy about doing church thing that you forget and you neglect your family. But you got to be in a place that a servant leader must not neglect their family. Servant leadership is about being a real man, about being a real woman. It is one of the most powerful forms of leadership is where you serve your family with unconditional love. That you're going to love them past their pain, love them past their proclivity, love them past all of those nuances that you name and put on the signboard. But you're still going to love them and that I'm going to continue to pray for you. We not, may not be able to talk to each other every day, but I can pray for you. But one thing that you know that you know that you know that I'm praying for you and you know that I love you. That I have that agape love, that unconditional love, the love that look beyond faults and see your need. So going that last mile, you got to go that last mile. Sometimes it may seem like it's the last mile. You have given out. You done gave and gave and gave and gave and took and took and took. And, and they have, have all put your name on the signboard. They done talked about you. They done, they done disrespected you, but you still got to love them. My God, being a servant of the Most High God, you got to go that last mile. If you don't love your family, who's going to love them? Say, you got to go the last mile for your wife, for your husband, and exercise an authority with compassion. Then say that you have to get into their mess, but you got to love them with compassion. Putting your family needs ahead of yours. Taking leadership decisions without thinking about your own agenda. Doing the right thing needs to be done and leading your family. Because when you lead your family and they continue to see that you're walking in character and integrity, 
sooner or later they will start following. Because the word of God says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and that when he grow old, he will not depart from. But you got to train them up. They may stray, but because you have built up that foundation, so it's important. No matter what, one thing my mama said is that she served, she loved her children. No matter how they may have done anything, whether they were in the jailhouse or in the poorhouse or on the street, my mama said, that's my son, that's my daughter, and I love them. I don't mean I love the acts or what they're doing, but that's my child. So I learned that from the example of the matriarch in our family, that you don't give up on your children. Because the very ones that you may seemingly give up, the ones that caused all of that problem back then, but because of the love and the character you walked in, that you love them past their pain, you love them past the way they talked about you, you love them, that that very one may be the very one that end up taking care of you because you have built a foundation. So you never neglect your family. So you can decide not to neglect your family and declare from this day forward that you're going to serve your family with unconditional love. And I'm going to prioritize them. Yes, we may not be in the same arena, may not be in the same place, but I love you. I love you with agape love. All of my sisters and brothers, my nieces, my nephew, my cousin, all of my friends, I love you. And that's what a servant leader is going to have to take on those characteristics and traits. So the power question for this one, are you placing your personal and ministry need ahead of your family? Sometimes that's a gray line right there. Sometimes it gets kind of real gray. And so we have to pray and we have to constantly do a self-evaluation to see whether that gray line has turned into a black line or a red line, whereas we don't cross the line and that we are here doing all of these things for the house of God, but then we're neglecting our family. And we're neglecting our children, neglecting our household, that, that our household is going to hell in, the, in a basket because we're neglecting them. You got to make sure that there's a balance. So our eight, and eight is a number, a new beginning, and it will be our last one. A servant leader is not weak. Glory to your name. A, do you hear me? A servant leader is not weak. And see, because, you know, growing up, I was shy. I was kind of timid. But just because it seemingly looked like I was weak, but I was just meek and humble. And it's okay to be meek and humble. So they are meek. Strength under control. Yes, yes, you cannot move me out of my place that God has placed me in. You will not move me out of my place of peace and sanity with all of your, your tactics. No, I'm meek and humble. But I want to let you know that it's just power under control. He said be willing to challenge the system. Be willing to ask questions. Take risks. And when necessary, be willing to change. Because he says, but you do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will. So meek come from the idea of meeking a heart. So which a trainer did. When, when I read this, I said, you know what? I'm going to add this in my book. It said, meek in our hearts, which a trainer did, not to take away its power, but rather to keep it power under control. So meek is a characteristic of being powerful, glory to God, but yet you're under control. What you see is what you get, and you don't know the power that we walk in. You don't know about this resurrection power. You don't know, he said, and you shall receive power, and after that, the gift of the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And he said, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is that power we walk in. But because I'm meek and humble, don't take me for granted. But don't take you for granted because we got the power. So meek is a characteristic of being powerful, but yet under control. Have you ever seen someone that got all this power and they ramping and raving and they said, look at me, look at me, look at me. And then you're like, you know, they're just so arrogant. 
so bogus. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And what I have found out from my history of these 57 years on earth is that a lot of people that, that have the outer appearance of all this power, all of this strength, that they are a big crybaby. Glory to God. That they just have a show. They have on a facade. They have on a mask. In essence, because when you are meek and humble and you walk in this power and this control and make them uneasy, if they can't get you off of being meek and they can't get you out of character, it unnerves them because what they, they are there to buffer you. They are there to try to move you in a place so that they can take your control. So I have often been told that I have a meek and gentle spirit. And at times I will respond because it was necessary because being in leadership and being an administrator and, and you know, and I, I had 300 people that I would serve as the leader in the facility, you know, I would have to say, please don't t mistake my meekness for weakness. It's just power under control. Because when you know who you are and whose you are and where you are in Christ, you don't have to holler. You don't have to curse. You don't have to make, I mean, I can walk like right now where I work at because my self respect me. And because I walk in character and integrity, when I walk in the department, the atmosphere changes. And they know I do it meek and humble. And they know I'm firm and I'm fair and I'm consistent. They know, yes, she has a meek spirit, but they know that it's just power. They know that... I don't have to curse, I don't curse anyone, and I don't expect anyone to curse me. I don't holler at anyone at work, and I don't expect anyone to holler at me. Because they know that I'm meek and humble, but they know the power and authority. See, when you walk in the power and authority God has given you, you don't have to use all those tactics. When you know that you have the power, see, see on the natural, I have a power of the pencil. And I can write when you're doing contrary to, to the plans and the principles and the standards of the facility. I have been given this authoritative power in the pencil that I can write you up. So God has given you the power and authority so you don't have to get out of character. And you said, please, please don't mistake my meekness for weakness. It's just power under control. When Jesus spoke about meekness, it was never meant to. To be a picture of him expressing that he was weak. Think about that. Jesus is our meek savior. Picture this. It's Jesus being under control yet powerful. You must have a heart to listen with the heart of God. As you listen to those you are serving. While exhibiting the power characteristics of meekness. So the powerless and final power question. As a leader. Are you listening with your head to your personal concerns of those you serve? Or are you listening with a pure heart to the heart of God for those that God has given you to love and to lead? So how are you listening? So you got to be meek and alma. It doesn't matter what is your rank, what is your status in life. We are serving. We see that Jesus, the greatest example that he was a servant. And he served with meekness because he recognized and he knew and he understood the power that he walked in. So I want to encourage you that you walk in the power and the authority that God has given you. So I want to pray for you tonight that you walk in character. I pray tonight that you take these eight principles of a characteristic of a servant leader. I pray tonight that you decrease and God may increase in you. I pray tonight that you take on the characteristics of Christ, that as you align your behaviors and attitudes, that you walk in a preparation for the assignment that God has for you. God has a kingdom assignment just for you. Because for your next dimension, it's going to be a dimension of service. I pray tonight that you are servant, that you serve with a humble heart. I pray that you do an examination so you can recognize the condition of your heart. I pray that your heart is an honest heart. 
that your heart is a truthful heart. I pray tonight that whatever you do, that you do it unselfishly, that your heart is unselfish. Father God, I pray tonight that they walk in a spirit of a servant, that they have a giving heart, that they're going to give out of their resources. Father God, I pray that they are fearless in their integrity with their time, their talent, and their treasure, that they're going to give, because he said, give, and it shall be given unto us, good measures, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and it's going to cause men to give unto your bosom. I pray tonight that as you are serving, that you're willing to suffer for Christ's sake. He said, many are the affliction of the righteous, but it's God that delivers us out of them all. I pray tonight that we take on the characteristic of the basin and towel attitude. That we're not so high-minded that we will not get down and wash our disciples' feet. That we won't get down and help and serve, whether we're serving in the janitorial, whether we're serving in the parking lot ministry, whether we're serving ushering in the daycare, whether we're serving in the food bank, whatever our hands find to do, I pray that you get into a place that you serve as unto the Lord. I also pray tonight that as a servant leader that you neglect not your family. I pray that you love your family, you pray for your family, that you're going to prioritize your family. And I pray tonight that you understand that you don't have to get out of your meekness because a servant leader is not weak. We just walk in meekness because we recognize that it's just power under control. We just thank you tonight for each and every one that's assembled here tonight, God. And I pray tonight that we have more loving people serving in the kingdom. Because we recognize that the kingdom suffers violence, and it's the violence that take it by force. Father God, I pray that something that I have may say it tonight will encourage you to start serving in the arena, in the territory, in the jurisdiction that God has assigned you to do. He said, many are called, but few are chosen. He has chosen you to be a servant. And I pray tonight that you will start just showing up. That promotion comes from showing up. That you're going to find whatever your hands find to do. That you're going to do it as unto the Lord. I thank you, God, that this is the confidence that I have in you, God. That whatever I have asked according to your will, I know that you hear me, God. And if I know that you hear me, God, I know that I have the petition that I desire when I pray. We believe that we receive it and we say it is so in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm Dr. Patricia James. I'm the pastor and founder of My Heart to You Healing and Deliverance Community Church, where our vision is that we live by faith. We're known for love. We exist as a beacon of hope. We are an equipping ministry that transforms lives through the healing and deliverance ministry of Jesus Christ because we are founded on love, and love never fails. So you be empowered to prosper, have good success, get into your assigned place, and start serving for the kingdom because we are building champions for Christ, and you are enough.